Hi everyone, my name is uh, Nikola Skiwan and thanks for listening in on my presentation here today. So for the next 20 minutes or so, I'll be talking about an empirical study uh, that is going to investigate the reception of documentary films about food from an environmentalist perspective. I've entitled the talk here, Exploring the Reception of Vegan Advocacy Documentary, a Preliminary Research Design for a Reception Study in New Zealand. So as some of you might already have picked up, my presentation today here is a little bit unconventional in that I'll be talking about a study that I actually haven't carried out yet. Uh, the reason for this is that the study will be part of a postdoc project that is starting here in September. Uh, and so what I really want to uh, take away from this conference and this, this talk here today is any kind of feedback, advice or critique that you think might be relevant for me to consider before I start on this whole endeavor. Uh, in order to do this, my presentation will therefore account for some of my preliminary reflections and ideas about how we might be, be just begin to think about and, and importantly also examine empirically the uh, impact and reception of vegan advocacy film. Now, finally, as uh, a last kind of caveat, uh, I also need to mention just briefly that as signaled by the slide here, that the study I am conducting is part of a larger project sponsored by the Carlsberg Foundation, who have been generous enough to award me a two-year postdoctoral scholarship that will involve several reception studies of environmental documentaries. Now, in large part, this uh, project builds upon and, and tries to sort of extend my previous contribution to the field of empirical eco-criticism, which has so far consisted in a qualitative reception study of the documentary Plastic China, which you can read more about in my chapter in the anthology that came out last month. So with these formalities out of the way, let's get started. I've divided my talk here into three short parts. First, I will briefly situate my study in its relevant sort of scholarly context just offer a few reflections on the broader research area that I, that I seek to contribute to. Second, I'll provide a preliminary outline of what might be termed the vegan advocacy film uh, and try to review some of the, the most relevant. Finally, I'll talk more directly about how uh, I myself intend to approach uh, this reception study uh, and give a few comments on the New Zealand documentary uh, called Milk that I will be working with. Part one, context. Within the field of contemporary media and literary studies, one of the most significant growing trends for the last decade has been the exploration of film and literature's relation to the environmental crisis. Advanced under the banner of eco-criticism, this analytical trend has more or less since its inception been based on the assumption that narratives influence our perception of the natural world. Whether it be in the context of literature, film, or television, several scholars in this field argue that stories can shape our attention, our values, and our willingness to act in response to pressing ecological issues. In response to this view, other eco-critics have been more skeptical about the transformative potential of these narratives, while others again have objected to the very idea of approaching such texts as instruments for social change. But regardless of whether one is optimistic or cautious or something else entirely, most eco-critics concur on the point that studying environmental narratives is important because they are understood to make a difference politically or culturally or ethically uh, and overall in how we navigate this ever uh, sort of increasing complexity that characterizes the contemporary ecological crisis. However, one of the most conspicuous shortcomings of much of the existing scholarship in the field is that it tends to be based on either anecdotal evidence, usually gathered in the context of classrooms, or, as in most cases, on the intuitions of the individual researcher. Despite their emphasis on the sort of social uses of literature, film and television, other media forms, Eagle critics have engaged surprisingly little with the contexts of media consumption, not to mention the question of who its viewers and readers are. Consequently, 
the fundamental limitation of much uh, existing eco-critical work is that it tells us very little about how real people experience the texts that we analyze and discuss. So this is where the project of empirical eco-criticism enters the picture. Empirical eco-criticism is, quote, a branch of eco-criticism that focuses on the empirically grounded study of environmental narrative and its influence on various audiences, end of quote. Now, in broad terms, the aim of this field is to bridge the gap that seemingly exists between the existing scholarship on environmental narratives found in eco-critical work and the somewhat unexplored experiences of those who consume such narratives. To do this, it combines methods from the social science with the fine-grained analysis of more conventional eco-critical reading. And in doing so, the project intends to cultivate a transdisciplinary approach that can shed light on some of the most crucial yet unanswered questions within eco-critical scholarship, such as do stories about ecological disasters motivate action or induce paralysis? Do films that portray ecological issues lead to a heightened appreciation of the natural environment? Or do they foster resentment, nostalgia, or something else entirely? Or in the case of my own research project, how do real people respond to environmental documentaries that urge us to change our lives by, for instance, shifting to a plant-based diet? This is the question that I will be investigating in my project, but before I get into the nitty gritty of my own study, I want to just briefly further situate this question in relation to the existing scholarship on this particular genre. Part two, vegan advocacy and its scholarship. So the specific environmental issue examined in this project is food production and consumption. Among environmental scientists, philosophers, and cultural studies scholars, food and food production, especially meat, dairy, and fish, is often described as one of the most crucial challenges of the contemporary ecological crisis. Animal agriculture, in particular, is a multifaceted issue that has ties to a variety of concerns, whether it be global warming or animal rights or anthropogenic pollution. With food production accounting for more than 26% of global CO2 emissions, the question of what we eat has never been more relevant. Throughout the past decade, filmmakers have sought to raise awareness of this fact, as seen, for instance, with the famous documentaries such as Cowspiracy and The Game Changers. But these are just two films uh, that constitute a small part of the larger body of work that some have begun to refer to as the vegan advocacy film or food documentary. A group of films that are beginning to look increasingly more like a consolidated subgenre within the field of environmental documentary more generally. Now, this effort has not gone unnoticed by eco-critics, who have expressed cautious optimism about the rhetorical effectiveness of such films. In an early article from 2010, communication scholar Laura Lindenfeld, for instance, pays attention to the ongoing politicization of food culture in documentary filmmaking. And she argues this new generation of films, quote, disrupts the myths we create about where our food comes from and what implications our consumption has on our health and the health of the planet. Looking sort of specifically at the film Food Inc., which is a film that provides a critical view on the food industry in the US, Lindenfeld argues that the emergent genre, quote, provides some hope that documentary filmmaking can uh, have an important role in communicating to audiences and facilitating action. Now, importantly, this is uh, not to say that Lindenfeld is just entirely celebratory, as she also expresses some caution about the actual impact of these kinds of films. She writes, relative to the hegemonic media industry, the number of viewers who consume these documentaries is quite small, a fact that ultimately undermines their reach and impact. Now, inasmuch as I find Lindenfeld's reason for caution highly compelling, um, it is still worth noting, I think, uh, the rather impressive popularity of films that have come out since the publication of the article in 2010. 
think, for instance, films like Cowspiracy that I mentioned earlier that came out in 2013, um, but also its later sequel, Seaspiracy, from 2019, uh, a film that at the time of its release uh, soon became one of the top 10 most watched films on the streaming platform Netflix in several uh, countries. Now, in light of uh, these kinds of changing reception histories, it might seem that the patterns of cultural circulation of critical food documentaries have been sort of shifting throughout the last decade. Uh, but without further empirical work, such claims will, of course, be entirely hypothetical. In more recent years, cognitive eco-critic Alexa Weick von Mosner has become another influential voice on this topic. In her uh, chapter, Screening Veganism from 2021, Bike von Mosner provides an overview of the genre and discusses some of its key narrative strategies and visual tactics. So in the chapter, she identifies at least eight characteristics that she claims um, characterizes the genre as a whole, although some films may, of course, only make use of some of these trends, while others can also be seen as, a, as an attempt to move away from earlier conventions. Now these are, one, a focus on animal welfare and rights, two, an emphasis on the health benefits of switching to a plant-based diet, three, depictions of experiences of transformation, as the film would often sort of showcase individuals undertaking their own journeys of discovery uh, into shifting to a plant-based diet, four, a specific focus on male veganism, as seen, for example, in the film uh, The Game Changes, that features male bodybuilders and athletes uh, that sort of tries to, tries to disrupt this conventional coding of veganism as, uh, as an inherently feminine undertaking. Five, an increasing attention on African Americans, along with other non-white individuals and their perspectives on meat consumption, which Mosner describes as an overdue corrective to the predominant whiteness of earlier vegan advocacy film. Six, a trend of mixing issues of veganism with other environmental issues, uh, such as climate crisis. Um, so many of the films here, are, and this is not only about meat production, uh, but they also showcase how these practices are linked with carbon emissions and the destruction of ecosystems. Seven, uh, there's also a recurrent trend of showing visions of the future in which meat consumption and animal cruelty is no longer the norm. And finally, a recurrent use of irony and uh, humor as a means to convey otherwise serious messages in a, a lighter and more palatable region. Now, each of these uh, characteristics, Master notes, holds their own advantages and disadvantages. For instance, by focusing on animal welfare, viewers may find themselves moved by the plight of the animals raised for slaughter shown <coughs> in the films. But at the same time, this strategy also risks alienating audiences that do not really care about animals, for example, or who are not sufficiently interested in learning the truth about the meat and dairy industry, let alone be, quote, willing to endure painful emotions during and potentially also after the, the viewing experience, end of quote. So from this uh, discussion of uh, the kinds of pros and cons of each of these strategies, Master's conclusion, like Lindenfels, is one of cautious optimism. As she reminded us uh, that, quote, the current assumption is that different types of films and arguments resonate with different communities and even with the same individual at different moments in life, end of quote. Now, ultimately, this suggests, or at least that's how I'm choosing to read it, uh, that in order to deepen our understanding of a vegan advocacy film and its impact, we need more studies of actual audiences with its diverse identities and dispositions. Part three, milked and my research design. So for this final section, I'm going to talk a little bit about one of the films that I'm going to be working with, as well as some of my initial thoughts on method. Milked is a New Zealand documentary from 2021, which, according to the film's website, exposes the so-called whitewash of New Zealand's multi-billion dollar fair dairy industry. In the film, we follow the filmmaker activist Chris Shurawai, who 
travels around the country searching for the truth about how the source of national pride, uh, that is dairy, has become the nation's biggest threat. The film then sort of showcases how New Zealand has rapidly gone from being a land with no cows to being one of the biggest exporters of dairy in the world. All the while making this uh, case that the industry uh, is falling uh, uh, apart and failing in every way possible. The film in this sense posits a stark critique not only of dairy farming as a practice but also of the neoliberal model of extraction that characterizes New Zealand dairy farming focusing especially on uh, the biggest dairy company in New Zealand, Fonterra, who are presented as the villains of corporate greed as they conduct their business at the expense of the environment and the lives of dairy farmers alike. Now, from a narratological and rhetorical perspective, Milk can be seen to follow almost every single one of the genre features, features that Weik van Masner discusses. It provides disturbing images of slaughtered animals, including a particularly vehement scene in which the filmmakers encounter a pile of slaughtered cow carcasses. It also outlines the negative health implications associated with dairy farming uh, and consumption through the use of uh, health expert testimonies. It presents a male protagonist who tells the audience that he too was just another ordinary New Zealander growing up with dairy on the table, only to later discover the negative consequences that uh, such a consumption entailed. The film also participates in the trend of featuring the perspectives of non-white subjects, exemplified here uh, especially by the protagonist himself, whose heritage stems from the indigenous Maori iwis of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Likewise, the film traces the effects of dairy farming not only for the animals themselves, but also the wider ecological impact in New Zealand and beyond. Finally, the film also attempts to provide a pathway forward by uh, suggesting alternatives to meat-based products and other avenues for farmers to explore uh, than animal agriculture, such as uh, growing vegetables or growing other crops. And to this, I would add a final feature that I believe the film has in common with um, other predecessors, uh, such as what the health, uh, cowspiracy, and seaspiracy, uh, namely the feature of uh, sort of using a frame narrative drawing uh, on the imaginary of conspiracy theory, in which an individual individual detective uncovers the truth uh, that has been actively hidden by a group of seemingly corrupt individuals. Uh, and alluding to this kind of network of operations that we only ever, just like a true conspiracy, can get a partial glimpse of. Now, in my study, I hope to elucidate how all of these strategies can be said to impact its reception amongst, amongst its New Zealand audience. Now, in my effort to investigate this film, I wish to address yet another limitation that is often embedded sort of indirectly in much eco-critical work, namely the fact that most of the audiences that we tend to engage with or refer to as evidence of the transformative potential of environmental media usually come from testimonies of our students or other academics. In turn, it seems likely that this bias might also apply to documentary viewership. Indeed, as Mosner herself notes, notes uh, quote, it is often considered a downside of documentary film that because its audiences tend to be highly selective, uh, self-selected, it preaches mostly to the converted, end of quote. Now, in order to avoid this scenario, my intention is to conduct the reception study with the New Zealand dairy farmers themselves, focusing on how they construct meaning from the documentary, the emotions the film might elicit for them, and the reflections it can cue. To do this in practice, I'm going to make use of gatekeepers within the New Zealand dairy farming uh, community who are going to help me generate a, a group of participants for my initial pilot study. In order to then recruit more respondents for the full study, I also hope to make use of the snowball method using my initial participants to establish more contacts with more farmers. In terms of data collection, I have in mind a um, longitudinal research design with an initial interview taking place immediately following a screening uh, around 30 minutes uh, one to one uh, with me leading the interviews. Semi-structured interview guides will then be formulated to guide the conversations 
Uh, and then a second follow-up instrument will be applied a couple of weeks later, uh, either qualitative or quantitative. I have not re really uh, decided on that yet. Uh, but here the focus will be on whether the film might have resonated with the farmers in the time that followed the screening. In order to analyze my data, um, I intend to analyze the film's uh, narrative and rhetorical components, which I will supplement with further interviews with the filmmakers about their intentions and aesthetic choices. The interviews with the farmers will then be iteratively coded for both thematic clusters, affective patterns, and of course variation. Finally, to offer a critical discussion of the film, I have in mind uh, doing a, a kind of analysis that can sort of compare the filmmaker's act of encoding with the farmer's decoding of the film. Uh, conceptually, this might be done using Hall's uh, rather established encoding-decoding model or perhaps Kim Schröder's more complex model of communication or reading. By doing so, it is my hope to contribute new knowledge of uh, how environmental media might pos contribute positively towards a changed future, as well as, importantly, uh, trying to also identify uh, some of the potential barriers that environmental media might face in this kind of effort.